opening address presented by Mr. Peter Oppenheimer. Peter Oppenheimer serves as a Chief Global Equity Strategist and Head of Economics, Commodities and Strategy Research in Europe for Goldman Sachs, which he joined in 2002 as European and Global Strategist. He is a member of the Global Investment Research Client and Business Standards Committee and the Senior Diversity Council. Mr. Oppenheimer will be available to answer any of the questions uh, directly after, after his address. And uh, now I invite you to listen to his address and then take part in the discussion. The floor is yours. Thank you. Jean Dobry. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry I can't continue uh, my presentation uh, in your language. So I'll try to uh, speak slowly and get the main points over <clears throat> from my perspective about how we at Goldman Sachs see the world economy developing and how we see the markets evolving from here. And firstly, before I do that, let me say that I'm very honored to give this keynote speech today, and thank you very much indeed for having me uh, here. Well, let me start uh, firstly with a simple slide that gives our main forecast for the major economies around the world. And I won't go through this in detail, but what I do want to do is just emphasize a few key points. The first thing is that uh, if you look at the global economy, the world economy, and that's the line right at the bottom there, the world economy, at the end of last year, so around this time last year, most consensus forecasts for global growth for this year were close to 4%. And if you look now at the consensus and also our own forecasts for the world economy, it's 3%. So the first point to make is that global growth has been weaker this year than most people expected a year ago. Secondly, what's interesting is that that 3% growth rate that we've seen uh, this year is the same as we saw in 2013 and also uh, the same as we saw in 2012. So in some senses, not very much has changed. We've been in a relatively low pace economic recovery globally for three years, well below the pace of activity uh, we were seeing before the financial crisis. There are, of course, differences of growth rates. Uh, you can see that uh, the US, if you look uh, at the top of this table, is expected to grow around about 3% next year, roughly the rate of growth we're seeing at the moment, so pretty strong. And there are some other pockets of growth that are strong as well. The UK, of course, here in Poland as well. But there are plenty of areas where there's weakness. And the Eurozone continues to be one of those areas where growth is well below the pace we were seeing uh, before the financial crisis. So although you are starting to see some reasonable areas of economic activity, particularly in the United States, it is important to emphasize this is not really a very typical economic cycle. Uh, so this chart for the US is showing GDP and how it has evolved from the recession in quarters uh, post the recession. <clears throat> the line at the bottom, the lowest line in blue, is the current cycle. And the other lines are showing the recoveries we've seen from other recessions over the last uh, several decades. So it is true that the US is now finally gathering momentum, but the level of GDP growth, even in the US, is below that that we would have seen uh, in previous recoveries. In the case of the Eurozone, uh, the situation is even weaker still. So this chart is showing in the dark blue line the current trajectory, the current trend of GDP growth across the Eurozone relative to those other uh, major economies in the world. So the Eurozone is clearly weaker. But what's interesting, if you look at the dotted gray line, which shows the recovery path from other previous major banking crisis recessions, the Eurozone is weaker still 
than we've seen in some of these other major episodes in the past. So the weakness of the Eurozone economy is particularly notable and, of course, has a big impact on this region uh, as well as other parts of the uh, global uh, economy. There is some good news, though, because although we have been in a crisis world, really, since the credit crunch started almost seven years ago, in the periods historically where there have been major banking crises or uh, economic uh, crises, such as the one we have been in, you tend to find that the economic recoveries, while they are slower, as we are seeing this time, they also tend to be uh, quite a bit longer. And what this chart is showing is simply the average length of economic recoveries coming out of different types of downturn. In a typical economic recovery from a normal recession, you can see that the average for developed economies is around about five years or so. But when you look at uh, the economic recoveries coming from more financial crisis-led recessions, uh, they tend to be a lot longer, uh, around about 100 months. So the fact that, for example, the US is already five years or so into its economic recovery should not really worry us, particularly when inflation remains very low and interest rates, of course, have yet to even rise. So again, evidence this is, that this is a very different recovery from those that many of us have been used to in the past. What's also, I think, notable about the global economy is the extent of disinflation. Disinflation is coming through in lots of parts of the world, and there are lots of reasons for it. The declines we're seeing now in commodity prices, the impact of globalization of the last decade, and of course the significant impact of technological innovation and disruption in many industries which is pushing down prices. What's interesting, uh, if we look uh, at this uh, table, which shows evidence from the US and the UK, two of the economies which are seeing strong growth and quite sharp declines in unemployment, is that while economic growth in the dark lines is quite high, uh, wage growth is actually very low. That's what we're seeing in the light blue lines. So even in the economies where you are seeing rapid falls in unemployment, strong rises in employment growth and economic activity, wages are really not picking up, and that's keeping inflation down and helping to keep interest rates very low as well. Now, this environment of weak growth and low inflation, in some senses, is very positive for financial assets. And let's not forget that from the lows in 2009, global equities have risen nearly 200%, and global bond markets have also performed very strongly. But there's a fine line between low growth, low interest rates, and low inflation on the one hand, and concerns that you're getting stagnation and deflation on the other. And you can see how financial markets have struggled with these two parallel outcomes in the way that they have performed just in the last year. So this chart, for example, for the United States is simply showing what's happened to the equity market, that's the light blue line, and what's happened to bond yields, the dark blue line. It goes back to this time last year. And you can see that there have been a number of phases where expectations about growth, inflation, have shifted. You can see from the period of September 2013 through to the end of that year, people were quite positive about the prospects for economic growth for 2014. Bond yields were rising and stock prices were rising quite strongly. Investors didn't really mind that bond yields were rising because they were reflecting stronger growth expectations. When we came into the start of this year, 
economic growth was much weaker than people expected, particularly in the US. Bond yields fell and equity prices also fell. Central banks then became much more dovish again, particularly with the Fed pushing out its guidance on when interest rates would start to rise. And from then on, from around February of this year through to the end of the summer, we had a period of significant low volatility, stable rising equity prices with stable falling bond yields. And it's only quite recently, really since the end of the summer, that we've seen renewed concerns about global growth. Inflation surprising on the downside, bond yields falling, and equity prices falling. So you can see just over the last year, we've had four phases where bonds and equities have moved either together or in different directions, depending on expectations of growth. <clears throat> The shifts in growth expectations uh, since September have been quite marked in large parts of the world. And we can see that both in the performance of equities in the recent correction, but also in the way that different kinds of companies have performed. And one of the ways we look at this is simply to take very cyclical or economically sensitive companies on the one hand and to compare them with very defensive companies on the other. Typically, when cyclicals underperform defensives, it's a reflection of declining growth expectations. And you can see that very clearly on this chart, both for the United States and for Europe. The ratio or the relative performance of cyclical companies has been very weak, particularly uh, since the end of the summer, and especially so in Europe, where people have worried about a renewed recession, and most notably with the very weak data in Germany that we saw for last month, uh, which has worried investors that the one economy at the heart of the Eurozone, which had the opportunity to grow, is also losing its momentum. So, the German stock market, along with many others, has also weakened. And what you can see on this uh, table, on this chart, in the dark blue line, is the relative valuation of the German stock market, the DAX, compared to the rest of Europe. And we've benchmarked that against the German Bund yield. And it's an interesting relationship. As the Bund yield has fallen, reflecting lower growth expectations, so the very cyclical economies like Germany have seen a derating in their stock market, even relative to other stock markets in Europe, which have also derated. So again, a reflection of how far growth expectations have come down uh, just recently. Well, there is an opportunity in all of this. It's true that the data has been weak, but in our assessment, the recent decline in stock markets globally has overstated the risks to global growth, even those in Europe. And the valuations are starting to look uh, very attractive. Here, for example, in Europe, we're showing the difference between the dividend yield in the equity market and the 10-year bond yield. Now, it's true that that gap has been high for some time, really, ever since the crisis started. But again, it is an indication that there's value developing in the equity market. And this is true not just relative to government bonds, but also relative to other fixed income assets like corporate credit, where spreads have narrowed, backed by very strong corporate balance sheets and also encouraged by lower government bond yields themselves. Here, for example, you can see a measure of the relative risk priced into the equity market compared to the risk priced into the credit market. We measure this by looking at the so-called risk premium, which we can back out from prices. The higher this is, 
the greater the uncertainty equity investors have compared to credit investors. And so you can see, again, equity investors are being quite cautious at the moment. They're already pricing in a lot of, uh, of uncertainty, a lot of risk uh, moving forwards. Well, this uh, has created a situation, of course, the uncertainty, where not just government bond yields have fallen, but all yield-generating instruments have seen their incomes decline. And that's made it very difficult for investors to find an income that they need to generate their required returns. This chart, for example, in the case of Europe, as a thought experiment, is just trying to show what proportion of a fixed income portfolio an investor would need in higher risk triple B rated credit in order to generate, for example, a 4% return. So even if you had now 80, 90, even 100% of a fixed income portfolio in the highest risk corporate credit, you would not be getting that 4% return. You can't get it in government bonds, you can't get it in investment grade bonds, you can't even get it in high risk bonds. And that's again one of the reasons why we think there is some value in the equity markets, particularly for companies which have strong balance sheets and decent dividend yields and are generating good cash flow. And there are many of these companies, uh, even in areas like Europe, where there isn't much economic growth. Just to show you that, this chart, again, pretty striking, is showing the proportion of companies in the European equity markets that have a dividend yield above the corporate credit yield. It's at a record high uh, by uh, some margin. And that, again, is a reflection of both relative risk and relative value. So when we look at capital markets, as I mentioned, we do spend quite a lot of time trying to understand risk premium. Risk premium is a measure of valuation. It's also a measure of expected future return. The higher the uncertainty, the higher the expected future return that investors require to encourage them to put money in that asset relative to a risk-free asset like cash or government bonds. And here is such a measure uh, for the equity markets. And in all equity markets globally, these risk premia are unusually high. This particular chart, again, is for Europe. And I've chosen Europe because it's even higher still than we have, for example, in the United States or Asia. So again, just to explain what we mean by this, the dark blue line, which we can extract from current prices, is the current equity risk premium or the required return for investing in equities versus government bonds. The higher it is, the more uncertain, uh, and probably the higher the prospective returns in the future. The light blue line here is a model that we have that tries to forecast where this is likely to go. And I think there are three observations. First of all, the equity risk premium is still very high relative to long-term history. Second point is it has come down from its peak in 2009 after the Lehman crisis and the beginning of the global credit crunch, but it is still high relative to history. And I think the third point is that the models that we have would suggest that gradually this will come down. And in the process of risk premia coming down, you should get a reasonably good return. When we look at risk premia in fixed income markets like government bonds, corporate credit, they are very low, suggesting the future returns are likely to be quite poor. So despite the uncertainties at the moment, and despite the fact that this is still far from a normal economic recovery, particularly uh, across the Eurozone and the broader European region, there is value in assets. These uncertainties are well reflected in asset prices. Investors fully know and understand them. And that should mean that returns 
can be quite good, particularly in certain parts of these markets. I think one other thing I just wanted to tie in with this risk premium is its importance for the corporate sector in reflecting what companies do with the cash that they have. Now, one important development of the financial crisis is that in most parts of the world, the corporate sector itself, companies, have actually got very, very strong balance sheets. So the crisis, even in Europe, wasn't about the corporate sector. It wasn't the corporate sector where balance sheets were weak. It was much more in the government sector. In a sense, this is quite unusual in a period after a recession. But what we find in this chart is that the equity risk premium, or that measure of valuation that I showed you, moves quite closely with the amount of cash that the corporate sector has, which is shown on the dark blue line. So during the crisis, as uncertainty increased, it wasn't just investors, but it was also the corporate sector that started to hoard cash, to sit on cash, um, so that the amount of cash in the corporate sector reached an all-time record high. And that's been true in the United States, it's been true across Europe, and even largely speaking, across Asia. But as this risk premium comes down, as uncertainty gradually reduces in a period of steady but low economic growth, you would expect to see companies doing more with their cash. They don't want to sit on all of this cash yielding basically nothing if they feel more confident about future economic conditions. So what do they do with this cash? Well, of course, there are various options. They can give some of it back to shareholders in the form of dividend payments or share buybacks, or they can reinvest some of this cash on the hopes of generating future growth, which they can do through making acquisitions, M&A, or through capital investment. Now, in some sense, we're already beginning to see this uh, evolution take hold, particularly in the US. In the United States, we've seen an economic recovery coming through more powerfully than elsewhere, and so there is more confidence in the corporate sector. So companies are beginning to use these huge cash piles um, to uh, generate high returns. In the last few years, for example, US companies have been aggressively buying back their shares because the cost of debt is so low relative to the cost of equity. And that's helped to boost their returns on equity and their profits and therefore stock returns. In the last year alone, nearly $450 billion has been spent by companies on buying back their own shares. In fact, companies themselves are the biggest net buyers of equities in the United States right now, well, not, or through the course of this year. They've also been big payers of dividends. Since 2010, US companies have increased their dividend payments by over 60%. We think that as you move forward in time, companies will also start to use their cash more to invest. We're expecting US investment to increase as confidence improves, capex spending will accelerate, and also M&A activity, which has been rising through the course of this year, is also likely to increase further. Uh, when we look at the, United, uh, the European region, that confidence is not yet here, and economic conditions are weaker. So, so far, we haven't seen much of those activities coming through. But we are expecting to see more share buybacks, more dividend payments over the next couple of years across Europe as companies start to give more back to shareholders, just as we've seen in the United States in the last couple of years. And we expect a similar trend uh, in Asia.
So this development of recycling high levels of cash in the corporate sector to benefit investors through boosting future growth or giving higher returns to investors through buybacks and dividends is, we think, a very important theme that's likely to develop over the course of the next uh, couple of years. Let me just move to another important theme, uh, and this is one that's obviously had a big impact uh, across this region uh, as well, and that is the emerging strength of the US dollar. And of course, over the course of this year, we've seen quite a lot of dollar strength against the number of different currencies, particularly, of course, the yen and the euro. Many people ask, has it got further to go? We think it has got further to go because this rise in the dollar is really only just beginning. If you look at this chart that goes back to uh, 1980, and this is uh, the US dollar versus other major currencies, a basket of major currencies, you can see really the dollar has been in a downward trend for the last 30 years. There have been some exceptions. It did very well in the late 1990s, for example, but generally it's been trending downwards. The recent rises that we've seen are only really um, just beginning. We're expecting, for example, uh, the euro to fall against the dollar towards parity by uh, 2017. And there are some good fundamental reasons why these dollar shifts are taking place, uh, importantly against the euro. You can see that uh, if you look at the spreads of interest rates between uh, the US and, for example, Germany, uh, and this is showing it both for uh, short-term, uh, five-year bond yields in the light blue line, 10-year bond yields in the dark blue line, those spreads are widening again. Interest rate differentials are becoming a bigger driver of currency moves, and also the prospective differences in economic growth, where these economies are in their cycle. So dollar strength, we think, is another theme to think about over the course of the next uh, couple of years or so. But it's also an important part of the adjustment process post the crisis. As the US economy strengthens, it needs less loose financial conditions. Europe, Japan need more loose financial conditions, and the weakness of their currencies will be one part, just one part, of the drivers for a potential economic recovery, albeit very modest, over uh, the next few years. Finally, let me just make a, a few comments uh, about uh, emerging uh, markets more broadly. And people often ask, you know, when you look at equity markets, is this a good time to be in the developed world? Is it a good time to be in emerging uh, equities? Um, well, it's been very difficult because of data restrictions to get long-term time series on these. Uh, at Goldman Sachs, we've managed to uh, splice together data for many different markets to get a longer-term measure of the relative performance of developed markets and emerging markets going back to the 1970s. So these are our own indices that we've created. But it's a very interesting picture because it shows you you've had some very long-term uh, swings uh, in these relative returns. And let me just stress, these are relative returns. So there are times when DM has done much better than EM, uh, but they are often times when EM is doing well in absolute terms, but just not as well as DM. But you can see here that over the period since 1970, there have really been three long relative bull markets of outperformance of EM compared to DM markets. And you basically had three quite long relative bear markets. Um, the bear market from in the 1980s lasted for six years. Uh, in the period from 1994, lasted seven years. And you can see that the relative peak of EM equities in aggregate uh, was in 2011. And we've had about four years of 
relative underperformance of emerging markets uh, since then. Now, there are many drivers of these relative returns, and in some ways, looking at the aggregate masks or covers up some important differences uh, within the different markets beneath the surface. But one important driver here is interest rates and economic activity. Um, so if you look at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at the concerns about emerging economies that really started in 2011, part of it was the concern about the epicenter of the financial crisis moving to emerging economies. Remember, the crisis started to begin with in the United States with falls in the housing market, which fed through to a banking crisis and the credit crunch. Then the second wave of the global financial crisis really moved to Europe in 2010 with the focus on the banking crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, and the recession. And then from around 2011-12, you started to see concerns about emerging economies reflecting some of the problems of the global financial crisis, particularly uh, with worries about shadow banking in China. But also some of the reacceleration of the underperformance of emerging markets through last year was related to concerns about rising interest rates in the United States as economic activity there picked up, um, particularly so for some of the emerging economies that had built up big external funding liabilities. So where do we go to from here? Well, we think that you've now seen most of the main underperformance of emerging markets in this cycle. In fact, in recent months, many emerging markets have outperformed DM again. But we also think that differentiation within emerging markets is going to be very important moving forwards. And that differentiation will be based on a number of factors, whether an economy is a commodity exporter or importer, whether it has strong financial balances or weak financial balances. But it is important to emphasize that despite the relative weakness in some of the emerging economies or stock markets in recent years, you are still getting strong inflows. Uh, and this data is, again, a little bit difficult to get globally, but we have managed to get some data here for US uh, mutual funds, for example, that are focused on emerging markets. And you can see in the dark line, these have continued to have quite strong inflows uh, all the way through uh, the period from 2011, and they continue to be pretty strong. There's a lot of demand in the world's biggest capital market, the US, for emerging market assets still. True, the ETFs have not seen very strong inflows uh, so much, but dedicated emerging market funds uh, are still seeing strong uh, inflows. So how do some of the different emerging economies look? Well, I did mention that one differentiation or one point of differentiation amongst emerging economies is the differences in their external uh, liabilities or external financing positions. An important part of that, of course, is current accounts. And without going through this in detail, uh, you can see there are very big differences across the broad uh, selection of emerging economies. In general, those in Asia uh, are amongst the strongest, with the biggest current account surpluses, places like Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, Korea, uh, Philippines, for example. Those with the weakest, um, which really suffered a lot during the so-called taper tantrum, when people worried about the end of policy easing in the US, still do have some financing problems or uh, deficits, places like Turkey, South Africa, uh, Indonesia, and also some of those in Latin America, Brazil, and Mexico. Poland here uh, is in a good position. It has uh, pretty much a current account balance and a reasonably good uh, government budget position uh, as well. I think one of the other interesting notable factors to tie this in with my earlier comments about disinflation is the differences in inflationary pressures across the many emerging economies as well. Generally, those that have 
big external financing positions also have inflation beating their targets. In other words, they've got too high inflation, which means they still need to keep interest rates high, even if their economies are weak. On the other hand, generally, those that have better external financing positions are seeing the same disinflationary pressures, undershooting of inflation, that you're seeing in many of the developed economies. And of course, Poland fits in uh, to that category as well, which suggests that interest rates are going to stay low uh, again for uh, a long time. So let me just conclude there, before I open uh, to questions, to say that this is still far from a normal economic cycle globally. Activity remains below the levels globally that we were seeing before the financial crisis. There is still a lot of disinflationary pressures, and that suggests interest rates will stay low, unusually low for a long time. In general, we think that's still quite good for risky assets. And generally, even in the areas where activity is very weak, like Europe, that's well priced in to markets currently. We think that income is scarce and growth is scarce, and therefore investors will reward areas where you can generate income, which will include companies with decent dividend yields and balance sheets, but it will also reward growth, the economies with the strongest growth, and of course, stock markets, which are a claim on future growth. We think that the dollar will continue to strengthen that companies will start to use their balance sheets more aggressively and distribute more cash to shareholders, and that the uh, underperformance we've seen generally of emerging markets over the last three or four years is probably bottoming out, but with more differentiation to come. So I will conclude my uh, formal comments there. Uh, I think we have uh, some time for questions. You yeah, will have some ten, ten minutes, so uh, if you if you really want to, feel free to ask any questions uh, that are necessary. Ten fifteen minutes, it's time for you to ask questions to Mr. Oppenheimer. Um, if you if you want to ask questions, just uh, raise your hand, and uh, um, a lady with a microphone will come up to you. Lady or man? Oh, here we've got the first question. Rafael Antrak Deloitte. Uh, I would like to ask you, how do you see developments in Russia? Of course, from the financial market uh, perspective uh, for Europe and the United States. Because if I remember, a year ago, Russia was actually missing in, uh, in, in analysis of investment banks, including Goldman Sachs, uh, when uh, actually forecasts for the energy prices were already quite obvious. So if you catch up with the analysis on Russia, uh, it would be nice to share with you, with us in Poland, uh, because this is the country that you are particularly interested in right now. Thank you. Right. Well, I think the, you know, clearly um, the political events that we've seen over the last year uh, came as a surprise, and that's had an impact on Russia and, of course, the broader region in terms of growth expectations. And we, like many people, of course, have revised down our forecast quite sharply. Um, things are stabilizing, I think, now at a very low level, and we're seeing some stability also in the ruble. Uh, much will depend on ongoing political developments, sanctions, and so on. But I think the big sort of shock from the downturn in the Russian economy has now largely come through. Uh, of course, it's had an impact here uh, in Poland and in the broader region. Uh, and this region, of course, has strong connections uh, to Russia. But also remember, uh, there are counterbalancing um, uh, factors related to other parts of Europe, which also uh, this region and this country are very tied into. In fact, um, you know, if you look at now, uh, the exports that Poland has made to Russia have come down very sharply, given the weakness of the uh, Russian economy and also the sanctions. They've fallen, I think, by about 15% uh, 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 or so over the last year. So now direct exports from this country to uh, Russia are around 4.5% of the total. But that's much less, for example, than exports to the rest of the Eurozone or to Germany in particular, which make up nearly a third of exports. So clearly, if we get further downturn recession in Russia, it is going to have a negative impact. But relative to developments in 
the rest of Europe to the West, I think that's going to be relative, much smaller, given that the market has now priced in a lot of the uh, developments that we've seen. So I think from here, it's difficult really to predict where things go, because much will depend on uh, you know, the political developments that we see. Um, but the economy is likely to remain very weak, currency is stabilizing, uh, and the most of the impact that we've seen from that has already come through in terms of hits to exports from countries like Poland, but also Germany and others to Russia. And therefore, what's really going to be important from here is the global backdrop and what happens uh, in the Eurozone, where uh, the connectivity is much higher. Are there any other questions? So we still have time for one or two. So I encourage you to ask the question if you feel like. Please raise your hand. Don't be shy. A bit. OK, I think that uh, they will still have time to ask the questions somewhere, somewhere in some other places. Uh, okay. You're definitely staying during the conference. Thank you very much, Mr. Oppenheimer, then. Thank you. Peter Oppenheimer. Thank you.